Oh, well, we'll figure it out. Yeah, well, y'all know this song, okay? Here we go. Here we go. Thank you. Button push your neck. Here we go. Sing it. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me. On Calvary, mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty. At Calvary, by God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I spurned. with me and talks with me and he tells me I'm his own. Yes. Let's sing that together.
This little chorus word of God speak a prayer to God that his word would speak to our heart tonight okay word of God speak would you pour down like rain washing my eyes to see to be still and know that you're in this place. Come, let me lay and rest in your holiness. Word of God, speak again. Word of God, speak. Would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know that you're in this place. Come let me sway and rest in your holiness. Word of God speak. Let's sing that one more time and make that our prayer, okay? Word of God speak. Would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see majesty to be still and know that you're in this place please let me stay and rest in your holiness word of god speak lord that is our prayer that you would speak to our hearts tonight that would be open receptive to what you have to say to us lord we're grateful for the opportunity that's ours for the privilege, for the freedom that we have to come and gather together and without any outside interference, just to worship you and to have your word proclaimed and, and invested in our hearts. And God, we pray that your holy word would speak to us tonight and we would follow uh, your leading and whatever you're calling us to do, God, we'd be willing to do that. We ask, Lord, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you. I'll be seated. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, we had a fun choir rehearsal tonight. That was a lot of fun. Good crowd here for that. And look forward to Easter. We're going to be celebrating Easter together in, a, in an amazing way. And Mark, I appreciate your leadership. So today we're continuing our study. Uh, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 4. These are the Pauline epistles. Uh, these are his letters to Timothy, young Timothy. And um, I think we made it all the way through verse 12 last time. Tonight we're going 12 to 16. And uh, we're going to be talking about disciple making from the perspective of Paul training young Timothy. And so if you would begin reading with me in verse 12, and we're going to the end of the chapter. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example to those who believe. We spent uh, last Sunday evening unpacking that one verse. Verse 13, until I come, give attention to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things, be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Father, I thank you again for your word, and we are asking that just as we sang, that your word would speak to us. I thank you that in a room like this, with everyone that's here, and, and anyone who may be uh, watching online, 
you have a specific word for them from this scripture. You're going to be speaking to us individually. I thank you that you're also speaking to us in a group, as a group. And so, Father, have your way with our hearts, and may we not just listen with eager ears, but eager lives. And we'll give you the thanks and the praise for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight what we're going to do is we're going to look at the goal of disciple making, a path to follow in disciple making, the power needed for disciple making, and uh, the reward, uh, the blessing in disciple making and the reward of disciple making. So we're looking at this from the standpoint of 2 Timothy 2.2 where the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, the things you've learned and received and heard in me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will teach others also. So we're keeping in mind that what Paul is doing here is he is training Timothy so that Timothy will train others who will train others. And that's all presented in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. So we're going to put on those lenses as we look at this passage of Scripture and say, what is he telling Timothy that he wants him to invest in other men? All right. And so the first is the goal of disciple making. Look with me again at verse 12. It says, look, let no one look down on your youthfulness. In other words, I know you're a young man in comparison to others in the church there at Ephesus, Timothy, but you're a mature man in Christ. You are a reproducing mature man. So don't let anyone look down on your age. Here's what he is saying. You can't tell a person's spiritual maturity by the calendar. There are some folks that are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, and they're still thinking like children. And there are some folks that are in their teens, 20s, and 30s, and they're thinking like mature men and women. And so it can't be seen by the calendar. And so what he's saying is don't let anyone look down on your youthfulness. Now, we got into the weeds with this one last week. So if you want all the specifics of what all this means in verse 12, you can go back and, and listen to that lesson again. Uh, it's available online. But for tonight, we're saying that the goal of disciple making is a mature man in Christ. That we as a body of believers be a mature man. Would you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4? And we're going to see it here where it says in verse 11, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets. Now remember that's New Testament and Old Testament. And some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. For what? for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Here it is in black and white, the goal, verse 13 of Ephesians 4, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. He wants our knowledge to be so complete in Christ that what? We're a mature man. To a mature man. Well, what is the measurement of a mature man? He finishes it in verse 13. To the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Now that's a pretty high goal, isn't it? I want you to be so mature in Christ that you think like he does. You behave like he does. You, your first reaction is a reaction like Christ would have. And not only individually, but as a group. That's his desire. So he's saying to Timothy, Timothy, don't let anyone look at the calendar and say, well, he can only be so mature because, you know, he is in his 30s or he is in his 40s. But instead, by example, let everyone see what you're saying and what you're doing and recognize you are a fully mature man in Christ. And by the way, I want you to present the church fully mature in Christ, as he said, the same Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4. 
So let's talk about this full maturity in Christ for a moment. Jim Putman has a book out called Real Life Discipleship. It's had good influence on my life. And he has narrowed it down to five stages of spiritual growth in discipleship. So if you want to jot these down, uh, you can. If you want to look for Jim Putman online, you can find it easily. Real Life Ministries is what it's called. And by the way, his ministry started out in a church like Mammoth, you know, out out in the country. I know people think we're in the country. Now, those of you who are here, you know you're surrounded by people. Uh, but folks that think about where our church is, they think we're out in the country. Well, that was true for Jim Putman's church. And uh, they've grown through this discipleship culture. Anyway, the first stage, spiritually dead. This is marked by unbelief. So people are not believing. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, the Paul, Paul says, you were formerly dead in your sins. And you know from the first weeks that I was teaching here, dead means dead. <laughs> okay, dead, 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 you're dead. Uh, th there's no spiritual life there. And that's the first stage. John Chapter 3 records Jesus' words as he says these to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you have all the degrees. You've got the training. You've got the fancy robes. Uh, you've got the reputation. But you're dead. You need to be born again. There's a physical body in front of me, but you have to be born spiritually. The woman's water breaks and there's a baby but the spirit has to move for you to be saved in Christ, born again, the spiritual life. And uh, so the, the first stage there is spiritually dead. Speaking of it as a body of believers, is it possible for a body that calls themselves the church to be dead? Well, according to the church of Sardis in Revelation, yes. Because we read uh, about Sardis, we'll mention them again later, that uh, they had a reputation of being alive, but Jesus said, but you are dead. Second stage is spiritual infancy. This is a stage where you're truly born again and people around you recognize there's a change. This isn't the same person. But you still have an absence of knowledge. You know, isn't it wonderful? Think back to when you were first saved, possibly, depending on your background. You, you may have come out of no fear of the Lord, and then you're gloriously saved, and then this is all brand new to you. I mean, wow, what's in here? You know, and, and you were at the point where they said, okay, if you look in the middle and open the Bible, it's Psalms, and then if you start heading to the, let, uh, to the uh, right, you're going to wind up in the New Testament. And if you head to the left, you know, I mean, you may have started there. I've had many young believers that I've had the privilege of leading to Christ. Boy, we even told them, oh, this is a Bible. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, it was written for you, and here's what it's about. So one of the defining words for spiritual infancy is ignorance. What's the cure for spiritual infancy? 1 Peter 2.2. 2. Like newborn babes crave spiritual milk. Okay? So in other words, the answer is always going to be God's word. <laughs> okay? You need the word of Christ in you as a spiritual infant. And then a spiritual child. This is the third phase. Spiritual child. Uh... Ephesians 4, 14, we were there just a moment ago. Let's go to it again. Look at 14. 13 painted the picture of the mature man to the fullness of the measure of Christ. And 14 talks about a spiritual child. Here it is. As a result, we are no longer to be children because what are children like? Well, they're tossed here and there by waves and carried about at, by every wind of doctrine, 
by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. That's why we say to kids, you know, stranger danger. <laughs> you're, you're smart. You're able to make some decisions on your own, but not everybody that comes along is your friend. That's what we teach our kids, right? Uh, because there's still some ignorance, but the challenge with the, the child is they're tossed here and there. There might be a little rebellion. That's why they need discipline, training. Uh, they're a little more self-centered than you hope. I mean, they're thinking about what's in it for them. All right? Uh, I know it's not like anybody in our room is like this, but you know church members who are thinking about what's in it for them. <laughs> church is about them. But they, and, they, and you need to keep them happy. Well, this is what it is to be a spiritual child. Tossed here and there. Emotions driven by how they're feeling, right? And we've, uh, those of us who have raised children, you, you know what we're talking about. The next stage is spiritual adulthood. Spiritual adulthood, they're more focused on God. God focused. They're able to do that. And they're starting to become others oriented. They can think about other people besides themselves. How is this serving other people? How are we ministering to them? In uh, spiritual adulthood, uh, we think of those who are more strategic, ready for independence. But even though they're ready for independence, they still need coaching. They still need a parent. Um, I've worked the majority of my career with people between the ages of 17 and 24. And so this is the group when, you know, I'll be talking to someone and they'll have such maturity and grace about them. I'll think, who is this person? I'm so impressed with them. And then 15 minutes later, they're standing on the couch with the water pistol, you know, shooting their buddies. Okay. I mean, there's some extremes there. But they are ready for that adulthood, and they are thinking about others. They just need more coaching. They still need someone beside them. But then the last stage is spiritual parent. These are the ones who are making disciples who make disciples. They're reproducing. And this is the priority that we read about in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. You know, it's good for us to step back and think about ourselves. You know, where are we in our spiritual development with Christ? Our mentors, the one who have invested in us, they've given their time to us. Are they celebrating because now we're thinking of others and we're carrying on their heritage because of the way we're investing in others? Uh, that's why we hear the apostles say, my joy is complete when I hear of your fruit, when I hear of what's happening with you, that, that brings so much joy to me. And uh, Timothy was that for Paul, even to the point he said, my true son, my true son. In other words, you're following my example. Yeah, the, the acorn didn't fall far from the tree when it came to this person that I discipled, gave my life to, invested in with my life. Now look at verse 15. So we're jumping to verse 15 now in uh, 1 Timothy 4. And I'm tying it to this idea of the goal of disciple making is to raise up a mature man of the church and a mature man and woman individually. Okay. Look at verse 15. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. So with each of these, we're going to jump to 15, and we're going to say that it cost us something. In other words, we're not going to move from stage to stage accidentally. Someone's not going to go from being a babe in Christ to a reproducing parent in Christ accidentally. Now, the Lord is faithful to his word, and you may open scripture and speak scripture to people, and it changes their lives because it's scripture. But as far as it being the pattern of your life, 
and the characteristic of your life, you have to take pains, exercise discipline. Now we're going to talk about the a path to follow in disciple making. We've been talking about the goal in disciple making. Now we're going to look at a path to follow. Verse 13 gives us a path to follow. Timothy, until I come to you, until we can meet again, until I'm in your presence and I'm teaching you face to face, here's what I want you to do. Give attention to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and a teaching. So we're going to talk about that for a little bit. Public and private reading. Uh, the way this is translated, it goes back and forth. Uh, it, it really just says reading, but here's this idea of, okay, is this public reading of Scripture? Is this private reading of Scripture? And I want to suggest to you, yes, it is. Public and private reading of Scripture. Now, we look... I bet most of us have a Bible that you're holding. This is a fairly recent phenomenon. We're talking hundreds of years that we have this phenomenon of holding your own Bible. So private reading is much more possible now. Uh, I think we've loosened up the, the bands of scripture memory because we now carry it with us. And not only that, we carry it with us. And so because of that, we, you know, we, we have the luxury of thinking, well, it's always there. Uh, I was challenged early in my life to memorize scripture because what, what happens if I wind up in a situation where I don't have access to this? Am I going to be someone who can provide scripture for those around me and for myself in a difficult time? And it could be that some of our Ukrainian brothers and sisters are in that type of a situation right now. So the daily reading of scripture, public and private, if you want to hear God's voice, I would just love to hear God speak to me on a regular basis. Well, then open his word. That's how you're going to hear it. It's not going to be just this mystical experience. He has promised to bless his word. That's why we were saying tonight, word of God speak. Well, that's a play on words. <laughs> word of God, well, who is the word? Jesus is the word. But how is he going to speak to me? Through his word. And Jesus told us in John uh, 14, 15, 16, then prayed it in 17, that the Holy Spirit is going to remind us of his word. He's going to teach us his word. So uh, daily reading, you know, whenever I hear someone say, you know, I just don't hear God talking to me anymore. He used to be so, okay, where, where are we on the scale of, you know, infancy, child, you know, young adult, reproducing adult, if they're not feasting on the word, of course they're not hearing from him. Now, I've even had dark times in my life where even reading his word, it was though I couldn't hear anything because the pain and the difficulties and the challenges that we face, those do make it seem as though we, we can't hear anything. But then in the middle of it, in the faithfulness of reading his word, he'll give you something to stand on. Uh, in one of the most challenging times of our lives, not between Donna and I, but externally, we had some things happening outside of our control. And as a couple, we were both reading the Proverbs faithfully every day. You know, uh, today's the sixth, so you read Proverbs 6. We've talked about that before. We were following that pattern. And I came home uh, from work that day and still thinking about the things we were facing together. And, the, uh, and I think it was spiritual warfare, frankly. But uh, Donna said, sit down, I've got something for you. And she shared with me a word out of that proverb for the day. And we stood on that for about three years. I'm trying to remember how many years we had to stand on that. But that one verse was like a light for us, okay? 
So if you want to hear God's word, there's got to be daily encounters with his word. Like I just mentioned, a proverb a day. You can do a psalm a day. This is the six, so read Psalm 6. Uh, you say, well, I've read the first 30 over and over. What do I do now? Okay, well, add 6 to 30. It's the 6, so you've already done that month. Now you're reading 6. Add another 30. Add another 30. Add another 30 until you get all 50 Psalms read. Public reading of Scripture, of course, that's what we're doing here. Uh, I'm committed to you as your pastor to not stand in front of you without an open Bible. I mean, part of the reason I'm here is because I wanted to be in a setting where if I was speaking, it was okay for me to have the Bible open, right? And I'm speaking the word. This is the calling on my life is to speak his word. So public reading of scripture. And then of course we ponder, we picture, we pray it back to God. It's a relational experience. So he says, first of all, reading. So a pattern for disciple making is to be in scripture. You know, it's not that complicated what I do when I meet with men for discipleship one-to-one. -one. And ladies, same thing for you. When you meet with other women, what you do is you model for them what it is to be in God's word every day. To hear it, to read it, to study it, to memorize it, to meditate on it, to apply it to your life, and to pray it back to God. And you model that day after day. And they pick up that pattern. And then they can introduce others to the same pattern. So the next is exhortation in the pattern of disciple making. First it's reading, next he says exhortation. That's called the public and private preaching of God's word. What do I mean by public and private preaching of God's word? Did you know that the psalmist would say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me? Who is he exhorting? Himself. So that's why I say private and public preaching. You ought to get really familiar with your voice preaching to you. Oh, my soul, wake up. Give praise to God. Why are you not lifting his name in praise today? He is great. He is mighty. That's you preaching to yourself. Someone comes to you with a negative thought. You get lamblasted with something that they're thinking or what you know, you've been there and you're experiencing it. You stop, you take a moment and you think about what you're going to preach to yourself. What are you going to say to yourself at that moment? Uh, there have been times when I've even gone to the mirror and looked at myself and preached a message to myself. Thanks be to God who gives you the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, Dale, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, 58. That's one of the reasons to have scripture in your heart through memory. So God can say, hey, this would be a good sermon for you to preach to yourself right now. But then we need godly counselors around us. And surely you have that. If you don't pray for godly counselors, plural, I'm saying that on purpose, plural, godly counselors, and then seek them out. Ask God to give you godly counsel and then seek out godly counsel. Uh, I want to be in that group of people for you that, uh, as your pastor. But I don't want to be the only one. The, I'm not the only phone number in your speed dial. Where's that person that you call and you say, I'm having a tough day and you know why, because you know me and here's what's happening. What do you have to say to me? And then you yield yourself to the sermon they're going to preach to you. And they have permission to speak privately to you. Not everybody has permission, but 
some people have permission, and if they don't, you need to find somebody that you're going to give permission to speak into your life. They need to be, be mature in the word. They need to have wisdom that's beyond where you are. But then not only that, because that's what Paul was to Timothy, but then also there needs to be public teaching. I don't know if you've heard, but there are radio stations that have almost 24-hour day preaching. I guarantee you I will not be jealous if you listen to these godly biblical teachers. Why would I not want a church full of people that are full of God's Word and full of exhortation and teaching? Now, there are some teachers I'm not going to be jealous of, but I will be concerned that you're listening to them because they're not preaching the truth. Not everyone opening a Bible and talking is speaking for God. There are all kinds of false teachings out there. If you would look with me again at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. We are no longer to be children tossed here and there by every wave of doctrine. <laughs> and the deceitfulness and trickery of men. And believe it or not, there are people holding a Bible who are being deceitful and tricking people into believing things for personal gain. And we read about that in, in, in Scripture, right? So we want to discern the spirits, but I'm telling you, there are plenty of preachers that you can listen to that are going to strengthen you. They're available 24-7. You carry them around in your pocket. And you know what? When I have downtime, I turn these guys on and I listen to them, right? I encourage you to do the same thing. If you want a list, uh, ask me. I'll give you a list of uh, preachers to try out, young and old, different ethnic groups too. I mean, I don't have a particular, you'll, you'll be amazed at the godly teachers God has raised up who know how to divide scripture. You can listen to it every day, you know? And then, when I'm finished preaching on a Sunday morning, you can come up and say, hey, I want to evaluate your sermon based on what Dr. So-and-so or Brother So-and-so said this week, right? Or Sister So-and-so. There's some great teaching out there. All right. So daily, public and private preaching of God's Word. Uh, Hebrews 3.13, encourage one another as long as it is today so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You may know someone right now, and they've not asked you to be godly counsel in their lives. But you know they need it, and they know that you love them. If God places them on your heart, it's okay to send them a text and say, been praying for you today, and put a scripture text on there. They may or may not look up the, te the, the scripture, but you've sent it and you've let them know you're praying. If they say, yeah, I do need prayer, I'm calling you right now. And then you call them and you let them talk. And then if they give you even a small window of opportunity, you don't pounce on it, but you gently uh, speak to them a word of encouragement. Why? Because it says sin is deceitful. And you're helping them be strong by speaking a word to them. And you say, but I have this list of reasons why I should not be exhorting people. Well, take your list, wad it up, throw it away, and exhort the person God's laying on your heart. Give them that blessing. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward loving good deeds not giving up meeting together, some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So in the pattern of disciple making, it's exposure to God's word daily. It is exhorting one another daily. And the last in this verse is doctrine. What is doctrine? 
Doctrine is a summary of God's word. You'll hear statements about doctrine. Well, doctrine is so sterile. Uh, I guarantee you, if you're married, your wife, men, wants you to know every detail about her, and she wants to summarize it in practical, healthy ways. She wants you to say it to her every now and then. She definitely wants you to be saying it to yourself. And she wants to be cure, sure that your doctrine about her is accurate. Yes? Jesus is our Savior and Lord. He's a person. The person of the Godhead, Jesus. We have our Heavenly Father. Do you think they want to know that our opinions of them are accurate? That we're not off? That we fully understand? And we're able to communicate that to other people? You know what that's called? Doctrine. <laughs> Teaching. Training. Uh, it's a, it's a way that we summarize what we believe. And I'm presenting doctrine, doctrine every Sunday. I'm saying something every Sunday that has to do with the basics of what we believe about God. I'll give you an example. Here's a summary. Salvation and righteousness comes in gift form only. Paul took a common Greek word and he crammed all the teaching of what I just said into that one word. It's a common Greek word. It wasn't a religious word before Paul got a hold of it. It wasn't a word Jesus used to teach, but it was a summary word the Apostle Paul used, and that word is grace. He packed it full of meaning to the point that now we sing amazing grace. What was Paul doing? Doctrine. He was summarizing. He was saying it's gift form only. Grace means, you know, it's something you receive that you didn't deserve. Okay? Uh, we have something called the Baptist Faith and Message, and every time we have people visit the church and they come to our lunch, we hand these things out, and we say, if you want to know what we think about Scripture, about God, about the Trinity, about salvation, about marriage, we want to make this available to you. It's available online. It's called the Baptist Faith and Message. And after we give this summary of each thing, there are all these verses afterwards. Well, guess what? To be a mature man as a church, we need to be solid in our doctrine. Because if we're not, guess what? Schemers are going to come along, and they're going to try to divide us over some little gnat theologically in Scripture. Okay? Now, I'm not as young as I used to be, but I still consider myself a young man. I guess I will... It's funny, old keeps getting older. Have you noticed that? It just keeps getting older. But I've been around the block enough times to watch churches split over the most minuscule things that are off one direction or another in doctrine. So doctrine's important. And he's saying a pattern for discipleship is daily engagement with God's word exhortation both private and public and sound teaching doctrine well guess what it takes work verse 15 again take pains with these things it's not gonna you're not gonna wake up with sound doctrine accidentally take pains with these things be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all and now the third the power needed for disciple making. Look at verse 14. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you. Don't neglect the spiritual gift. Remember it's God who is doing the work, not you. Uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, don't turn there because we're 
running out of minutes, but it says, in the last days, difficult times will come for there will be people who are lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, slanderers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Here it is holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Oh, they can explain why they're doing great. Here are the reasons. Here are the four charts. Here are the five, you know, top things for why they're doing so fantastic. A form of godliness, but denying its power. And then it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, avoid such people. <laughs> Again, uh, Sardis, Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. They have a reputation of being alive, but actually, according to Jesus, from his lips, they are dead. And what we want to do is be alive in Christ. Acts 1, 8, Jesus said, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. Here's the exciting thing about walking in the power of Jesus. You don't know where you're going to wind up. The Lord's going to take you to amazing places, close and around the world. Luke 24, 49, Jesus said, Behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. What's the promise he's sending forth? The Holy Spirit. And so he says in Luke 24, 49, But you stay in the city until you are clothed with power on high. So here, don't neglect the spiritual gift within you. God's doing a work within you. Don't allow yourself to think, well, I'm uneducated. Uh, I'm, I'm a failure. My family history is a mess. All these excuses. Again, wad those up. Toss them away. Look at the apostle Peter. Jesus chose him and raised him up to bear fruit that would remain. If he can do that Peter with Peter, he can do that with you. He can do that with me. Remember, our failures are a platform for God to declare his glory. <laughs> amen. I'll say amen to that myself. Uh, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you. Well, what are the spiritual gifts? We have partial list in scripture. There's nothing in scripture that has every potential gift that God could use through you. Uh, but we do have in Romans 12, a uh, partial list. We have in first Corinthians 12, a partial list in uh, first Peter four, a partial list, Ephesians four, a partial list. And in first Timothy, we hear uh, Paul talk about pastors and deacons, the office, right? So do not neglect the spiritual gifts within you, which were granted to you. In other words, gift form only. Gift form only. You do not choose a spiritual gift. The Holy Spirit decides what gifts are going to be use, yours. Jot this down. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. He chooses. Isn't that amazing? So it's not like I sit down and I say, well, I really want to do this, you know. No, I, I say, Lord, how do you want to use me? And he gives us these gifts. Just a partial list, uh, like serving or teaching or giving or leadership or mercy. Um, having faith. Believing God's going to do things. Uh, uh, ability to speak. This is just a partial list of things God can do through you. Uh, you know, when someone has that gift of helps, 
And man, they are just helping all around constantly. I don't look at them like, well, man, they ought to be teaching a class. No, I thank the Lord that they have the gift of helps because whatever they're doing right now wouldn't be getting done without them. And by the way, here's the thing about someone who's got the gift of helps. They're training other people to help who don't have the gift. So maybe it's just like the evangelist. They've been given the gift of evangelism because they're to train everyone to be evangelists. And I've noticed the same thing of people with helps. They train other people to help. Praise the Lord uh, for those with, with that particular gift. I remember when David James, my BSU director, my BCM director, when I was in college, he pulled out this game box. It looked like just a regular game box, and it had a board that folded out, you know, and it had things. I can't remember if there was something that you spun on it or not, but I remember it was a board, and it was about spiritual gifts. And it was my first time to be in a setting where we were talking about what are your spiritual gifts. And while that was happening, uh, I took a guess. I said, well, I don't know. Maybe a spiritual gift for me is this, and maybe it's that. And I remember my peers in college saying, well, I've already thought that about you, Dale. And David James, this man I respected, he said, well, that's probably true for you. Let's give you a couple opportunities to try that and see what happens. And then churches in the area began to ask me to do the very things that we were talking about that night. I wound up in student ministry because of this silly little board game he had, you know. Uh, uh, so one night across the street from the university. So notice this, there's a blessing in disciple making. We've already talked about all these other things, the power in disciple making. Now we're talking about the blessing in disciple making. This is when others recognize the gifts in you and they speak it out loud to you. Yeah, I think this is something that God's doing in your life. Isn't it wonderful when you've had that happen with you and God uses you in the blessing that others give to you? And then notice this, he says to Paul in verse four, I mean, says to Timothy in verse 14, with the laying on of hands by the presbytery is the way I read it earlier. It's also translated council of elders. It's also translated board of elders. Uh, it's also translated, you know, the pastors. In other words, somehow officially people are acknowledging your gifts and they're laying hands on you. And not only are they saying, yes, this is true of you, but they're laying hands on you and saying, we bless you to do this work. Oh, the blessing in disciple making. And now last, the reward of disciple making. Look at verse 16 with me. Pay close attention to yourself and to the teaching. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. I think he means salvation as in born again. But because he says you will save both yourself and those who hear you, I want to suggest that I think he means save yourself from a world of regret. Take pains with these things, Timothy. Teach these things. Lead people in these things. It's not just going to save you a world of regret knowing that you did that, but think of what you're going to do in their lives. This is the reward of disciple making. I had a young man uh, from New Mexico. He came into the BCM and... Uh, he was not living a godly life on any level. And uh, the Lord had me speak a strong word to him. He wasn't asking for a strong word. He wasn't asking for a mentor. But I stepped into his life and said, guess what? If you're going to hang out with us, you get me. And, and because of some things that were happening at the time, he either got me or he needed to disappear. 
So he got me. And I began to speak into his life and speak challenges to him and cast vision about what God could do in his life. And at a point of brokenness, when he was repenting, he was saying, is it true that I could be that godly man? Dale, you really know me. Could I be that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I think it's ironic that uh, the, the woman he married, her name was Grace. <laughs> well, it was a number of years later. I get a letter in the mail. Remember when we used to do that? He sent me a letter, and he said, Dale, it's true. God's making me his man. And in that letter, he enumerated, not in a boastful way, but in a humble way, all the things God had graciously done in his life. That's the reward of disciple-making. I don't know what his life would look like without intervention. And if I had not intervened in his life, maybe the Lord would have raised someone else up. But he allowed me to do that. Oh, when we see each other, can you imagine how rich our fellowship is? And I get to spend an eternity with this man. Let's pray. Father, we want to experience the reward of disciple making the blessing in disciple-making, the power found in disciple-making, the path, the disciplines in disciple-making, and, Father, the goal of maturity. Would you do that in us by your Holy Spirit? And we'll be careful to give you the praise because, Father, it's all because of Jesus that we can step into these things. We'll give you the thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.